Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Nathan Jones, the Internet Evangelist here at Lamb and Lion Ministries. In our last two episodes, we looked at the rapid rise of the globalist agenda that's bent on forming Satan's prophesied one world government, otherwise known as the Great Reset. We showed segments from our Great Reset conference held in late 2021 in Las Vegas. We began with Brandon Holthouse, pastor of Rock Harbor Church, who identified the Great Reset's agenda and the many names it masks itself with. I then explain how Satan is using today's technologies to create a new culture and ethos for the purpose of uniting the world to gain what Satan's always dreamed of, world domination and global adoration. Then Billy Crone of Get A Life Ministries covered the economic mechanisms that are needed to be put in place in order to control everyone's ability to buy and sell, known as the Mark of the Beast system. And finally, Don Perkins of According to Prophecy Ministries revealed from the book of Revelation what the Great Reset will look like once fully implemented, the Antichrist One World Empire. In this final episode of our Great Reset series, our Lamb and Lion Ministries senior evangelist, Tim Moore, will reveal a whole other Great Reset, what he calls the Greatest Reset. But first, before he reveals this, for comparison, let's let Tim summarize for us Satan's Great Reset. Well, we've been introduced to this man several times, Klaus Schwab, and Klaus Schwab is the leader, sort of the founder of the World Economic Forum. These are these elite people that meet in Davos, Switzerland every year, <clears throat> and you've seen some of their workings behind the scenes, and now it's, they're becoming bolder and bolder at being in our face about what they mean to do. Klaus Schwab said the pandemic, for instance, what Billy's called the plandemic, represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to do what? To reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. Again, letting no crisis go unused or an opportunity not seized. So here's his agenda. He wants to create a stakeholder economy, a resilient, equitable, sustainable, green technology mindset, and of course he wants to pursue what he calls the fourth Revolu industrial revolution. So we're familiar to a degree with the stakeholder economy. Billy touched on that, as did Brandon, and how it will distribute the wealth. Now, that sounds good in some regards. We'll help, we'll help the people who are destitute. But what they really want is to keep everyone at a level of not only impoverishment, but dependency to where the elite who are actually doing the redistributing are in control. So stakeholder economy, just realize you're not going to be a stakeholder. You're going to be a serf in this mentality or this ideology. As far as resilient, equitable, <clears throat> green technology, well, again, that sounds good, but it doesn't always work out quite that way. I can tell you just in recent years, the increase in efficiency in aircraft. I could go into a long discussion about how they've increased the efficiency of airplanes, your automobiles, etc. And those are good things, but they don't always happen as readily as you'd think. So this cryptocurrency that we hear about, even Bitcoin, well, Bitcoin, in order to produce this electronic currency that's make-believe money, consumes more electricity every year than the Philippines. And you think, how can that be? But that's what it takes. Many of the technologies they are touting, whoops, whether it is even the uh, fact that uh, they want to produce uh, windmill technology, what they realize is it is not efficient over time. So we're not quite there, but that's the goal. What about this fourth industrial revolution? Well, we're familiar with the first revolution of the great industrial uh, changes in the 1800s when steam power came online. We know about electricity that came online primarily for most cities and, and parts of this world in the 1900s. The third revolution of technology was with the information technology. And so that's already been discussed, computers and connected systems of communication, which we are all able to use to this day. But the fourth industrial revolution is supposed to offer a fusion, a coming together, a culmination of all these technologies that literally, quote, blurs the line between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about artificial intelligence, for one thing. How many of you have seen the new television show they're producing with avatars? Yeah, pretty freaky, isn't it? These people wear these suits, and they 
turn their persona into a computer-generated avatar that can be any color, can fly, have wings, do all sorts of weird things, <clears throat> and it looks lifelike. Every time I see something like that, I realize, well, we are about to the point that the Antichrist could have this uh, creature that looks real. Uh, I saw the other day how the U.S. Army has released a robotic dog that has incorporated into it a sniper rifle. All right, robotic dogs out there on the battlefield. But this drive toward artificial intelligence is going to take us places we cannot even imagine. There are scientists right now who are already producing chimeras. Anybody know what a chimera is? Chimera is a combination human-animal embryo. And they've said, well, <clears throat> we don't plan to let it necessarily come to full development. But they're trying, and somebody will very soon. What used to be the stuff of horror movies is now happening, and the revolution is taking place with increasing and breathtaking speed. So the World Economic Forum plainly states that this is their goal. And this is actually another demonstration of what we preach on being the birth pangs, things that start slow and then increase in frequency and intensity, as my daughter could have told you from last night, until the moment the baby arrives, but in this case, it's until the moment that Jesus Christ bursts from the heavens. And we've already seen a lot of advocates. You all saw a couple of my slides go ahead. In our nation, people like John Kerry, who for years have been promoting this globalist agenda. He tells you not to drive your car, <clears throat> not to eat hamburgers because cows have flatulence, but he flies his private jet back and forth to be a part of the international community in Europe constantly. And he's our green czar, whatever that means. All right. You've also seen people like this man, George Soros, who is spreading his wealth around to radically change this country. Uh, I think Billy showed a picture, maybe it was actually Brandon, of the father whose daughter had been raped in a bathroom by a transgender individual. The local prosecutor has personally shown up at his trial to personally prosecute him, and she was funded in her campaign by George Soros. And even the, the other attorneys said, we've never seen somebody prosecuted in a case like this. I mean, the father was at a school board meeting, for heaven's sakes, advocating for his daughter. But he will be put down by this particular prosecutor. Well, these people talk unashamedly of a brave new world and a new social contract, even as they would claim they know better than us unwashed masses. Well, you've also seen Joe Biden's Build Back Better campaign, which is essentially the socialist agenda of Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and they are on the ascend. Even in the Democratic Party that was already tilting far to the left, it's now completely controlled by this radical left group of people in Washington and elsewhere, and not just here in the United States. You can go to places like Great Britain with Boris Johnson. You can go to, at the top right there, France with Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel, can you imagine? God with us. Macron, yeah. Uh, in Canada, <clears throat> Justin Trudeau, and of course down in Australia, which for a season had been a land of sanity, which is now pitched over into insanity, you have Scott Morrison. Somebody you may not be familiar with, but driving Australia to absolute uh, police state right now. And so many others have used this new age dogma and are now using every lever of power, whether it's social restrictions or mandates, to lock in this new social contract. And so the progressive behind this ideology of a global citizenship are determined to strip nations and individuals of their sovereignty. That's what you've heard about all weekend, and it's true. And this push for unchecked human autonomy expressed in atheistic humanism and coupled with a compulsion to reach godlike aspirations harkens back to another time in human history when men built the Tower of Babel. Now, let me be clear. These rich and powerful elites touting this so-called great reset believe it will lead to a new age of enlightenment and world peace. There were actually people who thought that back at the turn of the 20th century, and what resulted was the Great War, at the time it was the greatest war, in the late 19-teens. Uh, and of course that led to yet another war. So this utopia will never exist 
until Jesus Christ reigns on the earth. But believing they can drive society, either willingly or unwillingly, toward this utopia, they're going to use every bit of technology, financial policy tweaks. You all saw Janet Yelton, Yellen the other day, uh, our Secretary of the Treasury that committed the United States to a global minimum of corporate tax. You think, well, that's fine. Let them pay the tax. Folks, who do you think pays corporate tax? It's not some board somewhere. It's us. I mean, they just pass it on to their consumers, but they're all on board to make this globalist mentality. And of course, an eventual unified government control. It sounds kind of like a society from 1984 or one that we've seen in places like China or Hong Kong or North Korea. And the dangers of these trends have been made clear by the previous speakers. So I won't go on and on other than to say that the true religion of this movement is humanism. None of these people affiliated with anything that you've seen would claim to be Christian. They reject Christianity because they reject any God that would be sovereign over the affairs of man. And they have a willful rejection of the divine in favor of unfettered human autonomy. But as I said yesterday, we know God is not impressed, and he certainly is not thwarted by their human schemes. Why? Because as Psalm 2, verses 2 and 4 talk about, the Lord sits in the heavens and laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, especially as the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Tim went on to reveal how the church is facing its own great reset, known as the rapture of the church. Jesus Christ will one day soon burst from the clouds and call his bride up to heaven before he pours out his wrath upon the rebellious world during the tribulation. The resetting of the church marks the end of this church age in this chapter of human history and delivers believers in Christ to that glorious beginning where we dwell with our great God and Savior face to face. I cannot wait. Well, what will this new chapter look like? Tim will now describe our eternal reset. So let's turn our attention now to what Paul calls the first fruits. This is the eternal reset to come. Our salvation itself represents what Paul calls the first fruits, the foretaste of an even greater bounty that awaits us. When we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up dwelling within us, and our bodies are called living temples of the Most High God. But a higher and greater reset will come when we have, in the words of Hamlet, shuffled off this mortal coil. Now, Shakespeare wrote, What dreams of death may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil? Ah, there's the rub, he said. And you can demonstrate his lack of faith when he said, that makes calamity of so long a life. In other words, Shakespeare thought this would be a catastrophe because we don't know what awaits any of us on the other side. At least his character, Hamlet, thought that way. But we do know what awaits us on the other side. If we put our faith in Christ, to die is actually to gain because we will not sleep or dream. We will be ushered immediately into the presence of of the Lord to dwell with him forever. So, if he stays is coming. If he stays is coming, what's going to happen to every person in this room? We're eventually going to make that transition. Some sooner and some later. Death is even more certain than taxes, or at least until the Biden administration gets done helping us <laughs> from uh, Washington. But we believe that soon and very soon, Jesus Christ will come for the church in a glorious event we call the rapture. And when that occurs, every follower of Christ will be caught up with him in the air to meet him in an instant. We'll be snatched away in the blink of an eye, what the Latin Vulgate calls raptur or rapamir. And we will join him when he appears in the heavens. You know, I've quoted Paul's letters several times today to the churches. The church in Corinth is pretty telling because even in that day and age, Corinth was an infamous city. It was known for its wickedness even in the Roman world. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for fornication is a derivative of the, the name Corinth. So the city of Corinth itself came to stand for fornication. And yet that's where Paul direct, or planted a church and directed his encouragement and his mentoring with the heart of a pastor. 
And toward the end of his first letter, he restates very plainly the core message of the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he rose again, as you just saw, or excuse me, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And Paul takes great pains to cite multiple witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, including himself, last of all. His point was to establish the fact of Jesus' death and resurrection and to point to the resurrection that awaits all of us who passed from this life but have placed our trust in him. He emphasized, if there is no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Thanks be to God, that is not the case. Christ is raised from the dead, and all of us who have put our faith in him are assured of our eternal destiny. And so Paul's exuberance reaches a crescendo when he touches on the great reset that awaits us as followers of Jesus. This is what he said. Now I say this, brethren, I'll add in sisterin for you ladies present, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit, or excuse me, the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ, or the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this imperishable, this stuff, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on the immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul recited this same promise of God when he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, a church he founded during his second missionary journey. And by the way, I so appreciate Billy's heart for sharing God's prophetic truth. I've had pastors who've said, oh, Tim, we can't get to Bible prophecy until I've laid a long foundation of other biblical truths because that's just real advanced stuff. And I answer them, really? Well, Paul was in Thessalonica for a few weeks, and he was already telling them about the rapture and the coming of Christ. How long is it going to take? Well, probably several years. Hmm. That's not a biblical model, folks. We need to hear about the prophetic word because it is what gives us resurrection hope, the certainty of things hoped for, as Hebrews spoke about. Paul actually said, We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, by which he meant dead, so that you do not grieve as others do. The rest who have no hope. The they we keep referring to over the course of this weekend. They have no hope. The wrath of God abides on them, not on us. And we will be delivered and rescued from the wrath to come. Paul goes on, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. There's that word, raptured, we call it, but in the Latin it was repumere, and so that's where we come with the English word rapture. It is in the Bible, just not our English translation, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I can't imagine comforting anybody with other words. It's kind of like a funeral. I always ask when somebody passes, did they know the Lord? Yes. Well, then I'll mourn with you, but I'll rejoice with them. They're with the Lord. They would not come back if given the option. Would you? No. And I only mourn with you because you're separated for a season. But in the morning comes joy. But if a person said no, they had rejected the Lord outright. I have no words of hope. I have no real words of comfort other than to say, you have the ability to choose differently. Let me tell you about the Lord because that person's fate is sealed. Now, 
it is not only for us to be encouraged by Paul's words and the glorious promise that awaits us. Paul actually wrote, the anxious longing of the whole creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the Son of Man, or excuse me, sons of God. That's us. When we are revealed in our glorified bodies, meaning when the Lord comes back. And not only this, but we ourselves, as we said earlier, having the first fruits of the Spirit, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So while the creation is groaning and suffering, we're supposed to be eagerly waiting for the redemption that we have of our own body. Are you eager? You know, creation's groaning. In other words, it was condemned to a fallen state in the curse. Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote it this way, nature red and tooth and claw that shrieked against his creed. What, what caused nature to shriek in pain? And cursedness has been ongoing as a groan for redemption and restoration. That is why the high priest every year would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat of the ark and on the ground in front of the ark, symbolizing that in the fullness of time, God would come and redeem all of creation. The entire creation has been looking forward to that. As Isaiah describes in chapter 11, the wolf will lie down with the lamb, not the lion, by the way, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And he goes on with other descriptive terms of how nature itself will return to a harmonious state where even these poisonous Animals, even these predator and prey, will once again live in perfect harmony, as was intended at the beginning. So if all of nature is groaning for the Lord to return, are you? Is your spirit groaning within you? Are you eager to be set free from its corruption, or slavery to corruption, your body's slavery to corruption? If you don't think you're a slave to corruption, look in the mirror and then pull out a picture from, how old are you, Nathan? 29. 29. Pull out a picture from when you were 21 <laughs> and you'll realize I'm a slave to corruption. Ugh. <laughs> are you eager to be set free from that into the freedom of the glory of the children of God? Or as the cares of this world stifled your hunger for what is to come? So to sum up, what are you looking for? What are you eager to receive? Let me just sum up. Here's what the world is going to receive. The scoffing world will receive judgment and destruction. You talk about a great reset. Oh, they're going to have a great reset. Uh-huh. One that is horrible beyond words. The groaning creation will be restored, returning to the harmonic state that existed in the Garden of Eden. The Jews, those persecuted, persevering Jews, will finally reascend, re receiving final sanctification, honor, and preeminence in the world. And we could touch on many passages that point to that reality, which is why the Abrahamic covenant still exists. God is blessing those who bless Israel and cursing those who curse Israel. What about individual Christians? Well, brothers and sisters, when Jesus comes for us, we will receive our glorified bodies. We will be 29 years old, I think. I think it's about the perfect age. But we'll receive glorified bodies and even more important, eternal communion with God. And for those who have loved Jesus appearing, as Paul talks about in 2 Timothy 4.8, not first, we will receive a crown of righteousness. Do you love Jesus appearing? Do you look forward to it so much that you wake up every morning practicing your rapture exercise. What was that? Just rapture drill. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Or is it just, eh, maybe someday. I don't know. Are you whole hum about that? So once again, the pagan world is expecting a great reset, but the reset's going to occur when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords emerges from the heavens. When he returns in glory, he will sh separate the sheep those who have heard his voice and followed him, even in the midst of tribulation, from the goats, in other words, those who remain ornery and reject him at every turn. The sheep will go into the millennial kingdom that I've already described, while the goats, the unbelievers, will be sent away into eternal punishment. 
Have you put your trust in Jesus? You know, the culmination of this whole conference, that we have to focus on this most important question, not to what's happening in the world. Somebody asked today, how can I make a difference in what's happening in the world? That young man actually had to leave. There's a degree to where none of us individually can impact what's happening in the world. But this message is not just about what's happening in the world. This message is to ask you, what's happening in your heart? Are you already a child of God? Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Because if you haven't, what's happening in the world doesn't really matter in the eternal scheme of things to you. But if you have put your trust in Christ, then no matter what comes, you will have the ability to endure. So there was a television show a few years ago that was called I, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And at the end, they'd say, is that your final answer? And they'd lock it in. Let me just say, the wrath of God abides on all those right now who have not received his son. John 3.36 says that. And it will be poured out in full measure. Hell will be your final answer. And you won't be able to phone a friend or ask the audience or reduce your options. Too many people today might as well be carrying a sign. My eternal destiny, my choice. And it really is. As a songwriter philosopher for the band Rush once wrote, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. And too many people today think, well, I'll get around to deciding. You've made your choice. You're not promised another day. You're not promised another hour. The Great Reset has led us into fearful times, but I want to leave you with a verse Tim ended his presentation with. Matthew 10, 28 reads, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's a stern warning for those who have yet to have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. But as Jesus so lovingly promises his children in verse 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Grab hold of Jesus' lifeline of salvation today and then place your faith and trust in God's sovereignty. He has this all under control. Good will win and evil decisively defeated. And if you would like to get your own copy of the entire Great Reset Conference, which includes five one-hour long sessions and a six Q&A session, then order your three-disc DVD copy for a gift of $25 or more, which includes shipping. Just call the number you see on the screen or order online at lamblion.com. Until next time, this is Nathan Jones speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yeah.